One name why, my sister, are you afraid? I was. Why were you afraid? They do not look like me. Why are you no longer afraid? The girls like me will see me. When I started writing this talk, I think I wrote three different topics. I wanted to write about many things, many issues I had witnessed from being, uh, from living in two different countries. Yet I was running away from digging deeper, from unwrapping the silence that surrounds certain important issues. You see, I fall victim to that. What should be said, what should not be said, what should be written, what should not be written. However, as an immigrant in these United States, as an African, as an Igbo woman, as a Nigerian, I know how important it is that stories must be told, that we must have to reveal our observations sooner than later, that the time is always now. I'm a storyteller. I borrow more and more from James Baldwin's idea on being a witness to two continents. About eight years ago, two very important incidents happened to me that would change me forever. I began a very strong friendship with a former schoolmate of mine. It was through a poem called Yellow. It was a poem about how depressed but optimistic I still felt. She would tell me how the poem gave her hope, how she was battling a kind of depression. She was healing from the wounds of childhood trauma. The second important incident was one evening with five of my friends, all African women, when the issue of childhood abuse was brought up. All four out of six of the girls had been survivors of it. You see, I couldn't shake it off. There in the living room of one of our friends were stories being unwrapped, silence being unwrapped and told. But we always knew that it should always stay between us. They told me stories of how they felt betrayed by family members after they had revealed that they are abused to them. They told me about having to battle trauma alone. But in all of these stories, it was the insistence on silence that terrified me the most. The idea of what a woman, a woman like, woman like me can and cannot say. It is a tradition of silence that insisted that what they had gone through was something to be ashamed of, something that devalues you, the survivor. Whenever we examine our society, we find time and time again that silence benefits no one. Instead, it continues a deadly cycle. It tells you that your emotions, your feelings, your depression is not real. It insists that if a narrative needs to be told, it should be one of survival. See, we have a way of doing things. We have a way of glorifying survival, but not the process of surviving. After all, my friends, these women should be grateful. They are in a country that gives them more rights as women. Or it tells you that you should be grateful you survived it, but don't tell it. Yet we forget that, we forget that humans cannot carry such burden their entire lives without breaking down, without hurting themselves or others. We forget that define the culture of silence, define the tradition of silence, which I call an act of civil disobedience, is how change happens. It is when we speak up against what hurts us that we can have a societal shift, no matter how small. The tradition of silence insists and demands your full cooperation in erasing your stories, in not owning and telling your stories. Because it is one thing to know your story, it is another to tell it. Telling your stories gives you the pen. It gives you power and gives you privilege. And in cases where for centuries you never had that, it is not only a privilege, it becomes revolutionary. 
That is what I'm, what I'm drawn to. I'm drawn to stories of women who defy the tradition of silence. I'm drawn to how we can change the status quo, how we can change policies, and how we can tell our stories. I'm drawn to re-examining the tradition that says, that says silence is a virtue. My secondary school mate would later seek help. She would, in the following years, own and tell her story. I'm encouraged by such power, because how can we keep telling stories of only strength and not weakness? It was in recognizing that the tradition of silence was hurting her that she found the strength to speak up, seek help, and tell her story of trying to survive depression. But there are three important things that make up the tradition of silence. One I call the three C's. They are culture, code, and cage. You see, the culture is what you're born into. The culture tells you that certain stories do not fit. It tells, you that if, if it tells us that if our narratives do not fit the status quo, that something is wrong with us. For instance, my schoolmate, our call Chinwe, was told her depression is not real. She was told her trauma is not real. She was told how ungrateful she was to be in one of the best schools in London and still feel empty. So, it got worse for her. How dare a woman, how dare an African woman feel traumatized? The culture insists that silence, no matter how broken the survival feels, is strength. Think of why some women stay in abusive marriages. It is the culture that insists that she's nothing without a man. And when she has children, she owes her children a marriage. She is, no matter how broken, no matter how sad, will be blamed by society for failing to stay. So what would a woman without support, a woman without her own source of income, a woman in a society with little or no laws that protect her do? She stays in that abusive marriage. The culture of silence gives you a side eye when you complain. It says, look at you. Don't you know your mothers survived these wars? You must learn how to hide your wars in the morning. You must cover it up. Young woman, young man, do not shame us. Now, the culture creates code. The code is this. We must not speak about our pain. We must not break down. We are strong. The code creates superhumans. A pride in how much you can carry. Because if you dare break the code, then you're automatically seen as a failure. I, I, I think it's very funny, you know, how society thinks that softness is not part of strength. The culture of silence creates a code that masking your pain, denying your story, and not telling it is how it has always been and how it should be. The code will use tradition. It will compare you to others. It will shame you into not owning and telling your story of surviving. Both elements of culture and code create the cage. This is what the cage is. The cage is where our, all our untold stories go to die. All our different narratives, when they are not told, all they go to die. The cage is the final destination when the tradition of silence is not dismantled. We fear that when we open the cage, we are going to meet isolation. It is better to be quiet it is better to honor the code than for you to open the cage or feel you have the power to tell your story or own your narrative. But I'm a little bit, I'm quite optimistic, you know? 
There are solutions to the three C's. We have to understand there are stories within stories, some more complex than the other. Stories many of our cultures deny happens. Stories that when left untold leaves us with a community, with a society without proper representation. When we tell people that they should be quiet because their stories do not fit what we know, we deny the importance of diverse narratives. When we deny the importance of hearing what others have survived, like when I sat with my friends years ago, we deny them the power to feel less alone. When I sat with my friends a few years ago, years ago, they felt less alone. When I connected with Chinwe, she felt less alone like I did. We should also seek to encourage people to tell their stories by listening with an open mind. If someone confides in you, telling you that they are depressed, do not brush it off and say it does not happen to people like us. Encourage them to tell their story. Sometimes listening is giving them power to own their story and break through the tradition of silence. Remember your vocabulary. You're not allowing or letting. You are encouraging them. Allow or let is placing power in your hands. You're not in charge of the story. You're not in charge of how they decide to tell it. Encourage, not allow. We should not tell others that their experiences, though different from ours, need not be told. In overcoming the tradition of silence, we must understand that it is not weakness to seek help. And we should encourage people to do that, to go and find help. Yes, we can suffer from depression. Yes, we can seek, to, we can seek therapy. Yes, you can speak to a therapist. No, we must not break our backs carrying silence like a badge of honor. Remember, how we heal from pain is different, as different as our lived experiences. It is important to understand normalizing pain is a tragic cycle that must end. Another solution is localizing the issue. For instance, in Zimbabwe, there are friendship benches in certain townships where women who have been taught to listen, healthcare advocates sit and listen to these women. People, these are people who have been told your problem isn't big enough. Women who are at a disadvantage, who carry pains and just need to be listened to. Now they can sit and understand their pain is valid. This is how change happens. Their stories are just as important for them to own it and to tell it. For power to be given back to the survivor. We must also understand how these stories, no matter how different the names or distant the locations, are part of the human experiences. If our silence continues, how can we add our lived experiences to the human story? We also have to use bigger lenses to see the world. More importantly, as people with a story, as people with a pen, we must tell it because we are witnesses to it all. And this is my form of civil disobedience, dismantling the tradition of silence by encouraging you and everyone to tell, to own, and encourage others to own their stories. Thank you. <laughs>